Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Facebook live broadcast. My name is Steve Altishan. I'm the Director of Client Partnerships here at Land and Home Family Law. And today I'm here with Abby Settle. How are you doing, Abby? I'm well, thank you. Well, I'm good to hear. So today, Abby, let's talk about prenuptial agreements. You know, what they are, what they can be, and you know, maybe how they can be helpful in a particular situation. So let's just start right with the basics. What is a premarital agreement? A premarital agreement is a contract between two people who intend to get married. It's a document that's signed before your marriage um, and outlines uh, both of your positions on the different rights that you have, that you will have as a married couple. Um, it's technically a contract and uh, we have laws, statutes in the state of Oregon that control these agreements. So it's before marriage, a document reviewed, signed, drafted by both parties that lays out what you expect in case of a divorce. So a contract, then I'm assuming it's, there's no oral contract, an oral prenup kind of a thing. Correct. There, it, this is a written document that both parties have had the opportunity to review. Uh, both parties have had the opportunity to have a counsel, an attorney review for them. If they so choose, um, it needs to be signed. It does not need to be notarized in our state. Certainly doesn't hurt, <laughs> um, if, especially if there's issues later on down the road. Uh, but that's correct. It's not an oral agreement. It's not a uh, email back and forth. It is a piece of paper that is signed. Got it. So that's before marriage. Is Correct. there a similar thing that, that people can do after they get married? Yes, there is something called a marital agreement. Um, people might refer to it as a postnuptial agreement. Um, there's a few different circumstances where this happens. Sometimes you're about to get married and you mean to sign a prenuptial or premarital agreement, but it just doesn't happen for the wedding. Um, so then you're a couple months in and you think, oh God, we didn't do that. Uh, we meant to, we thought about it, but we never got around to signing it. At that point, the agreement becomes a postnuptial agreement. Uh, these also happen, you know, many years later on in the marriage. Quite frankly, I often see them after they're the parties have talked about separation and decided to stay together, but only on certain terms. And that, and those terms become reflected in a document, which becomes a postnuptial agreement. So we've talked a little bit about how they're created. Um, what, you know, is, is in them generally? I mean, it, we talked about, I think you, you mentioned, you know, different kinds of obligations or rights. I mean, are there certain rights and obligations that are are usually laid out in a prenup or can be amended or waived or anything like that? Right. So in the state of Oregon, when you get married, all of your income, all of your assets, your houses, your cars, that all becomes a portion of your marital estate. And what both a premarital agreement and a post marital postnuptial agreement can do is outline how each of those assets are going to be treated. So that includes spousal support, property, real property. Um, if you have a collectible car and that's something that if you get divorced, you're going to take with you. That could go in there as something that's going to be attributed to you. Um, you can also decide how you're going to get divorced. You can outline if you want to pursue mediation before you actually go to attorneys and go to court, uh, how one party will pay the other's attorney fees. That's often in these agreements as well. Is, is the, um, are there things not allowed or that aren't enforceable that are put into premarital agreements? Um, you know, but couldn't you could have an agreement anyway? I mean, are there other kinds of agreements that 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 you can do? Let's say you're not planning on getting married. Mm -hmm. 
There are other agreements. They're not controlled under the same statutes. So if you wrote up a cohabitation agreement, for example, um, two people who want to live together and share their lives, but they do not intend on getting married, that is not enforceable in the court the same way that a marital agreement is. Um, they don't have the statutory backup. Right. So you mentioned the premarital, the marital, uh, sometimes you'll do it right off the bat, sometimes you'll do it years later. Mm -hmm. Just a quick, quick question on that one. So when does it become effective? When does it actually start? Let's say you, we signed a, a premarital agreement eight months before the wedding. Am I, am I subject to something up until the wedding day or, or how does that work? It is at the time of marriage. So in these agreements, there's gonna be, like with any contract, there'll be an opening paragraph that talks about who's signing, why they're signing, where they are, um, the who, what, when, and where of the contract. And in that it will say, well, any good premarital agreement is going to say, uh, the parties sign this agreement um, on the understanding that they intend to get married. This agreement is enforceable at the time of marriage. So because the intent is to deal with marriage and divorce, if you never get married, the contract is never enforceable. Flip side, mm -hmm. we're at the altar. I'm suddenly going, hey, hey, I don't want to do that prenup anymore that I signed. Yeah. And then you get married. Is there, does it formally have to be, you know, unsigned? I mean, it is a contract after all. Absolutely. Both parties need to then agree to modify, cancel, um, and then that then needs to be written too. Otherwise, you made that agreement, then you got married. You can't forget about it. Oh my gosh! So between the I do's, you gotta you gotta kind of re renegotiate. Right, and you know, say like you said, say you're at the church and you look at each other and you think, God, I I don't want to put rules on our relationship. I don't want to put rules on what we're going to do. Well, if you don't do the follow-up work to make sure that that contract goes away, 15 years from now, when you get divorced, you're going to be the one crying about it. I got it. Got it. No, no email the night before and then go get married. Right. So prenups and postnups, um, is there much of a difference between them in the in just the legal sense of what they are? This is one of those lawyer answers that I'm going to give you where I'm going to say it depends. Oh, because, I love those. Yeah, the contract in itself is, uh, they're both pieces of paper with promises and expectations that both parties have signed. And when you bring them to the court, the court is just going to ensure that everyone was able to review. They were uh, mentally capable of signing. Um, but the court does favor premarital agreements over postmarital, postnuptial agreements. Uh, it is easier to overturn a postnuptial agreement than it is to overturn a prenuptial agreement. That makes sense. I mean, kind of a weird analogy. It's even easier to overturn a non-compete that you had to sign after you became employed. Because, exactly. You know, one side's got more power going at that point. Exactly. And that's, you know, sort of why the courts do that. They assume that later on in the marriage, there's the parties aren't on equal footing typically when you make a postnuptial agreement. It's, uh, you know, I want these things to continue to stay in the marriage as opposed to both parties choosing to enter into a marriage. So uh, the burden becomes higher to, excuse me, becomes lower to overturn a postnuptial agreement. So would you talk briefly about about things that were in a prenuptial agreement? What can they what they can cover? Um, they 
can they go past the monetary, the, the kind of rights that are built into a marriage? Can I have it written in that, you know, my spouse will do the cooking? You cannot. <laughs> no, that's not something that the court is ever going to enforce. You know, the beauty of these documents is you can put whatever you want in them. Um, can you enforce them later on down the road? No. Well, can you enforce things such as, you know, he's going to do the cooking and, you know, I have to have, you hear stories in the news that celebrities will put in, he's going to pay for my Botox every month for 10 years. Is that enforceable? No. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. The, um, can, can you put things into a, a prenup that aren't strictly divorce related? I, mean, I think I've heard of disposition of property on a will or can you do other stuff? Yes, you can talk about what to do in the event of one spouse's death. Um, you know, I think we all have experienced losing a loved one and there's a lot more to it than their bank account goes here and this gets paid off, um, especially for persons who have children from other marriages. Um, you can outline exactly how you anticipate another child would be taken care of. Um, it, you know, it's a concern for a lot of people. Will my child from my first marriage uh, be given access to my estate in the same manner that my children from my second marriage will? Um, because well, there's a second wife, for example, who now is in control of that estate and making sure that it's going where it needs to go. So how do you provide for everyone in the case of a death? That makes, that, that makes sense. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to say, oh, we'll never get divorced when it's two divorced people looking at each other ready to get married. You know, right. They, they're, maybe there's a little more common sense, you know, in there somewhere. Right. The, I was just gonna... uh... oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I don't, we didn't talk about one huge divorce issue, and I'm wondering why. Child support. Yeah. Child custody parenting time. Can those things go in? So again, another lawyer answer, you can put in your expectations. And it's always good to talk about these things before you're getting married, or if you're considering a change in your marriage, outlining these things in a conversation between the two of you does take some of the sting out of it in the end, if you do end up getting divorced. But the court will not enforce agreements made about child custody, uh, child support, those types of things, because uh, courts in Oregon and all over the country use something called the best interest standard to determine what your child's parenting plan, custody, and we use a calculator for child support. But all of those things are dependent on what's going on in the child's life right then. Um, there are so many things, as we all know, that can happen between a marriage date in one year and 10 years down the road, and you've got this little kiddo. Um, maybe your premarital agreement says, oh, mom will get custody of all children and dad will have every other weekend. Well, mom could have a lot of problems in those 10 years, and that might no, might no longer be an appropriate award. So you can talk about your plans, but the court will not enforce them if it is not in the best interest of the kid. Yeah, uh, that just conforms with, with the law. Um, yep. So the, the court will, you know, will not enforce certain things. And that kind of leads to a, of a question of, are they, is there a clause in the law? Are they actually enforceable? I mean, you know, it, it, are they hard to enforce? Are there reasons they won't enforce? You know, I know a lot of people talk about, well, after two or three years of marriage, they won't enforce it or things like that. So are they, are they generally enforced in court? Premarital agreements, yes, are generally enforced in court with the exception of long-term marriages. So I'll back up a little bit. Um, premarital contracts, 
For example, when I'm filing a divorce for a premarital contract, most of our divorce petitions say, you know, there needs to be spousal support, uh, equal division of the house, an equal division of all other assets. When I'm filing a case that involves a prenup, I just say each of these items need to be devised as the prenup states. And then I, it's a very simple process. We file a simple judgment that says, you know, the premarital agreement controls and outlines exactly what to do with each item. And that works really well for marriages of, like you said, two to five years. Um, when you start getting into longer term marriages, there's a chance that the court will choose not to enforce a premarital agreement because the circumstances of the parties have changed so significantly. We get married when we're 20 years old, we don't have two pennies to rub together, and I invent the computer. And our, you know, now I've got a billion dollars and my premarital agreement says that my husband gets nothing. You know, I retain all of my own bank accounts. I retain all of the retirement that I make. Um, that is not fair. <laughs> and the court will not enforce something that unfair or, you know, maybe you didn't invent computers, but you have a drywall company or something like that. Well, that makes sense. I mean, you know, there, there's, it, it kind of sounds like a hybrid between contact, contract law and family law, divorce law. Right. The, um, well, oh, oh, yeah. That's kind of the guts of the, of the way they work on a legal aspect, you know, how, how you do them, how they, you know, how they enforce, get enforced, uh, which then leads to kind of the overarching question of who should get a prenup? Um, I mean, who are they, who do they work best for? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that it's just not something everybody should do because it's there. As an attorney, my answer is always everyone should get a prenup because, you know, like we touched on before, there are other aspects of your life that you can determine and make easier for yourself through a prenup. Even if you don't have any money, you know, no house, no big bank accounts, no uh, investment accounts or something like that, what you can decide is how you're going to deal with each other in case of a divorce. Um, we all know getting married is expensive, right? So say you have a wedding and you spent $10,000 on your wedding. You had a great time. Uh, what people don't realize is that getting divorced is two or three times more expensive than getting married <laughs> um, because you're both having your own party. <laughs> You've both got attorneys um, or even if you don't have attorneys, it's a stressful time that you're devoting a lot of your free time to figuring out or paying for a mediator, um, paying for appraisals on property. Divorce is expensive. And if you decide together early on that you're going to use a mediator and avoid the court as much as possible to get that done, it's better for everyone. It opens up a really honest conversation between uh, engaged people to you know, talk about how you're gonna deal with something really hard. It also lets everyone know on the date of marriage, here are my debts and here are my assets. I think often people get into marriages and don't realize, oh, my spouse has $17,000 in credit card debt. Is that now mine because we're married? Well, if you had had that conversation before you got married, you could have talked about how that was gonna get paid off. It's hard. Nobody's saying it's easy to talk about finances and divorce when you're planning a wedding or um, just after your marriage, however, whenever you decide to do it. But for those reasons is why I suggest that everyone gets one because it at least starts really hard conversations and you can look at it um, from a non-emotional stance. So you don't necessarily then have to decide uh, 
you know, spouse A gets this and spouse B gets that. You could have something that just talks about, you know, mediation, arbitration, um, how the process of how you're going to work things out, right. as opposed to trying to do the actual numbers. Right. So, um, as an example, I'm I'm recently engaged. Very excited. Can't wait to get married. Right. Um, we're young people. Our assets aren't huge. We make similar livings. We don't have any intent of discussing spousal support or how things will be devised. Uh, but as an example, I own real property. We do not live in that house together. We've never lived in that house together. Um, and it has a certain amount of equity that I've earned over the past 10 years, right? Well, I didn't know my fiance when I first bought that property and started earning that equity. So we will likely take a look at what that property is worth in cash to me today um, so that later on down the road, if we're fighting over, well, at the time we got married, her house was worth X dollars or X dollar or Y dollars we'll have a piece of paper that says, no, this is exactly what it was worth at the time you got married. So then we're no longer fighting over historical values of items. That makes great sense. I mean, whether it's a, a, a ring or a painting or a house, I mean, you know, since, since Oregon courts can divide ultimately how they want to in a, in a, in a divorce, um, you're not saying that they can't you know, make a division, but you're at least getting value sent. So that can be, you know, doesn't that be fought over? Right. When you start getting, when, when you're in a divorce, the term premarital value starts to get thrown around a lot. And it's a lot better if you have a piece of paper that you both sign that says, this is what it is. Uh, we also get, we become nasty people when we get divorced. And, you know, you might ask your partner today, you understand that that house is mine, right? And that equity is something that I earned. And you're not, oh, lights turned off on me. <laughs> One second. Here we go. Um, and they'll say to you today, oh, of course that's yours. You earned that. You, that's your money. Uh, I can guarantee you the story will be different in 10 years when you get divorced. <laughs> so disclosure, you, 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 Talked about disclosure and why that's important. Um, uh, can it also torpedo a, a prenup if someone doesn't disclose? Absolutely. As with any contract, if you are not providing all of the details, um, especially because these contracts are about your finance, your marital estate, what's in it, how is it going to be devised? If you have a, an account sitting in another bank that you've never told your spouse about um, and they made certain agreements because they thought neither of you had any money <laughs> and then come to find out you've got a million dollars sitting somewhere, the court's going to say that's not an enforceable agreement because both parties were not, uh, did not have full knowledge of the circumstances when right. they saw it. That makes sense. You know, you go to parties, you go to, you know, talk with friends and uh, sometimes that subject comes up with prenups. And you know, a lot of people, you know, kind of poo poo that. And then they turn and they say, well, you know that just means you don't trust each other. Well, is that true? In my opinion, absolutely not. That means that you trust each other enough to have a very honest conversation about finances and expectations in your marriage conversations that everyone should be having, but often they're not going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and in the end, if you start the conversation and you choose not to sign that premarital agreement or even draft it, at least you're discussing what exists and what your expectations are for the future. That kind of leads to another, you know, sort of, thing people think and a lot of it's it's because of the celebrity botox you know thing is that that they're just they're just for you know protecting per wealthy people or, or especially the ones with the most assets that's all they're good for 
it, yeah. it's the it's a poor person protecting the rich person, but that's not really true, is it? Absolutely not. These agreements exist to protect everyone. When you have this conversation before your marriage, you might both be professionals earning a lot of money every year. Five years down the road, you have a child and one of you becomes a stay-at-home parent. Well, if your agreement states that you know, no party will ever get spousal support. Everybody keeps what's their own. But now you have one party who hasn't worked in five years. It's going to protect that person in the future as well. Um, our lives change. We need to think about everything that could happen. And yeah, it could protect a rich person who goes into a marriage and to say this $20 million I had will stay my $20 million no matter what we do, but it will equally protect that other, if it's drafted correctly and you're not um, influenced into signing it for any reason. Um, it also gives the other person clear expectations for how they're gonna be supported at divorce. And that leads obviously to that it's a contract and mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure you can, you know, get a, a Zoom or other online, you know, copy, but it's a contract and it's got a lot of legal stuff. So seeing a lawyer is pretty important, isn't it? Absolutely. A $400 check to an attorney to review your prenuptial agreement or postnuptial agreement could save you tens of thousands of dollars later on down the road. Um, should you end up in a divorce situation. And again, like you said, not just divorce. It, it's got to do with, with how you, if you pass or, or any of those situations, right. again, protecting both parties. Right. The, you know, we hit this again. Uh, people who don't have assets. Mm -hmm. um, Neither of them do. I mean, you know, it's a couple of church mice getting married. And the there's still a reason that they can consider signing a prenup. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, uh, and again, it talks about, you know, what to do. Good prenups talk about what to do in case of death. Um, it talks about children from previous relationship. It talks about, um, you know, it could talk about any other big life decisions that you might have to make um, down the road. Um, it, there's all kinds of things that it can cover. Um, not, again, I'll say you can put anything you want into these agreements. Not all of them are super enforceable. Not all of them are gonna be something that you are going to court for later. Um, it might just be good discussions that you have about your plans for the future. And you can modify these, can you? You can, um, they, if it's a prenuptial agreement and you're doing a modification after you're married, it, it sort of morphs into a marital agreement. Uh, but the courts are gonna look at that and say, look, these people saw their circumstances change. They saw that their earlier agreement was no longer fair and they adapted it. That's gonna make it even more enforceable than, uh, than a, just a plain like marital agreement. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of information. It's all really helpful. Um, and I see we're we're coming to, to our end of the end of our thirty minutes. But so, if if there was anything, you're sitting there in front of a client, and um, you're talking about whether or not to get one. You know, is there any any sort of thing you would say to them, you know, if they're considering it, but not sure. I would say to them, you know, what is your concern? Is your concern that you're not going to get married because your partner won't sign this premarital agreement? Well, what's in it that they don't want to sign it? What's in it that they think isn't fair? Because that's going to speak highly, um, against this person and you need to decide for you if if their insecurity 
in an agreement. They agree to marry you, but they don't agree to support you yeah. equally. That's concerning. Um, these agreements should never be unfair. They should provide for both parties equally. Um, and as a person who bills a lot of money every day on divorces, I wish that everyone would sit down and talk about these things and write them down and sign them before they get married. Yeah, it, it, like you said, it's sort of a, it's, it's negotiating between people who are probably more reasonable and open to negotiation than afterwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, wow, this was great. This was really cool. Uh, terrific information. Thank you, Abby. This is, this was just very, very helpful to people. You know, and, and again, I'm just going to add, it's always wise cult to consult an attorney, you know, make sure that you do not just have something, but have something that, you know, is long lasting and works. So thanks. Just thanks again for joining us, Abby. Sure thing. And everyone else, thank you for joining us as well. The uh, questions that anyone might have, please feel free to post them on Facebook. Uh, you can also shoot me, Steve, at LanderholmLaw.com, any questions you have. And so until next time, everyone stay safe. Have a great day. See you Thanks. next time.